Hey, welcome to the lecture 8.3 covering inverse trig functions. Um, we uh, spent the last two sections learning about the trig functions themselves and how they um, appear on the graph. And um, I was very careful in my language um, when we would talk about, say, the secant function. Um, as being represented by 1 over the cosine, that is a reciprocal function. So um, tonight we're going to be talking about what inverse functions are and how we use them. So let's just start off by uh, wrapping our brains around the idea of an inverse trig function. Now, I will remind you that way back in college algebra, you learned about inverse functions. And one thing that you learned about the inverse functions is that um, the domain of the given function f is the is the is the output or the the range of f inverse of x. So um, we get the phenomenon that okay. So if we have if we have just the regular trig functions that we've already studied, we know that let's say we take the sine of theta, some some measure of an angle. And that gives us the ratio, in the case of sine, that is opposite over hypotenuse, so that, so that ratio. And what happens when we see um, the inverse sine function, also known as the arc sine, the inverse sine, or sine inverse, the um, the domain is the same ratio that we got to the corresponding sine function, and the output is the measure of the angle. So say we have some, some uh, problem that we're trying to figure out, and it says the sine of um, x is equal to 1 half. Okay, so the sine of some angle measure is equal to one half. Well, if we take the arc sine or the sine inverse of one half, we get out what that angle measure was that gave us the one half to begin with from the sine function. So um, if you'll focus your attention on that paragraph in the center there, we recall that if we have f of a equaling b, then it is absolutely the case, as long as the function is a one-to-one -one function, that f inverse, so that's a negative one that that's raised to, of B is A. So that just follows from our definition of inverse functions. Um, but we also know that sine, cosine, and tangent are not one-to-one -one functions. They, they fail the, the horizontal line test um, miserably because I mean, with sine and cosine, we've got waves happening, and tangent, you know, we have that repeating, um, we have that repeating S curve that would also fail the horizontal line test across multiple periods of it. So um, what we do to start talking about inverse trig functions is that we end up restricting the domain so that it represents one, one portion of the graph that we can then um, um, find an inverse for on that restricted domain. So it's now going to be important for you to understand the restrictions that are necessary to place on these trig functions in their domain so that we can begin to talk about the uh, the inverse of these functions. 
So if we have um, if we have the sign, if we restrict the domain of the sign function, you know, normally we start it, we start at the origin, and then we start making that wave. Um, what we generally restrict the sign function to is for it to live between negative two pi, uh, I'm sorry, negative pi over two and positive pi over two. So we're just talking about that that um, the, the part of the wave that's happening between um, those two x values. We restrict the cosine, so actually let me, let me write out that restriction underneath here. That is an inclusive, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 inclusive, because we do have values at those boundary x values. We do have output values there, so those are inclusive. Cosine is restricted between 0 and pi. And we're going to take a look at, okay, well, why are we restricting um, between these specific values um, in just a moment when we take a look at the unit circle. It'll, it'll all begin to make sense then. This is also an inclusive domain, so we go from 0 to pi. And it's inclusive because I actually have outputs at an x value of 0 and an x value of pi. And then finally, the tangent function, we restrict also between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Now, these are non-inclusive because those are actually asymptotes on the tangent function. <clears throat> so it's non-inclusive pi over 2, uh, negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, non-inclusive. So um, looking down at the bottom, we have the inverse sine function. Y equals sine inverse of x means that x, equals the sine of y. So I've just flip-flopped my domain and range there, my input and my output. And it also tells us that we can also note and call um, sine inverse function the arc sine. And both are used interchangeably. And it, we don't say inverse sine function, we say sine inverse for whatever reason. Um, and once again, note the restrictions on the domain. Um, so since we restricted our sine function to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, we will also restrict that sine inverse to the same domain. Um, and we'll see a picture of what those graphs on the same set of axes looks like here on the next page. So we have inverse uh, cosine function, also called cosine inverse, also called arc cosine. And um, once again, here's that same domain restriction that we put on cosine. And um, it also tells us up here that we have that same relationship that y equals sine inverse of x if and only if x equals the cosine of y, just flip-flopping those domain and ranges. And finally, we have the inverse tangent function, same flip-flop of the domain and range, same domain restrictions that we are placing on the tangent function between those asymptotes. So here is a picture of each of those functions graphed with their respective um, inverse function. To find the domain and range of inverse trigonometric functions, we switch the domain and range of the original function. Um, okay, so if I have 
sine of x between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Another, another um, characteristic about inverse functions that you learn way back in college algebra is that when you graph a function and its inverse on the same set of axes, the identity line y equals x will be a mirror of reflection for those two functions. So this is just a visual representation of the trig functions with their respective inverses. And um, you can see how that line of identity is that line of reflection between the functions themselves. Okay, so this is just a reminder of your domain restrictions. And um, now we're going to see if we actually understand that definition. So this next part is super simple, but it, it really does help you know that you know that you understand about flipping that domain in the range. So if I have the sine of 5 pi over 12, and that is approximately 0 0.96593, the um, relation based on this function here of the inverse sine would be sine inverse of 0 0.96593 equal to 5 pi over 12. So you can see how this would be useful if perhaps you didn't know what angle gave you that particular sign in radian. Allie. And I see you're typing something. In the inverse function, would you use the equals or approximate? That is a great question. I use equal because 5 pi over 12 is, a, is an exact value. Now, if I had divided 5 pi by 12 and gotten the decimal equivalent, I would use the approximation because I'm pretty certain that, that it would be a number that I would need to truncate and round. But 5 pi over 12 is an exact value, so I use the equal sign. Does that help you understand that, Allie? Yeah, anytime you can write a number as a rational number, which is basically just a fraction, um, then, then that's an exact value. All right, so the next one says, well, if the cosine of 0 0.5 is approximately 0 0.8776, then I know that the arc cosine of 0 0.8776 is equal to, I could either write 0 0.5 or I could write 1 half because that is a rational number. All right, so that's just making sure you understand the flip-flopping of the domain in the range there. Okay, so now getting into the real business here. Um, finding an exact value of expressions involving the inverse sine, cosine, and tangent function. So if you're given one of the special values that we love to work with, the ones that are sitting on the unit circle for us. We're given a special input value um, to evaluate the inverse trig function. You want to find that angle x. Um, so we've got them listed all the way around the circle, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3. Those are our angle measures in radians. Um, 
which the original trig function has an output equal to the given input for the inverse trig function. If x is not in the defined range of the inverse, and this is important, we have to remember what those restrictions on the domain are because they're going to, sometimes they're going to, we're going to be asked to find um, something that lies outside that domain. What we do is we find another angle that gives the same result that does lie in the restricted domain. So I'll just remind you of those domain restrictions. For sine of x, we restrict the domain to negative pi over 2, pi over 2. So before we move forward, let's talk about what that means. Basically, on our unit circle down there, when we take the sine of x or the, or the arc sine, we are restricting ourselves Okay, so here's pi over 2 up here, and here's negative pi over 2 down here. We're restricting ourselves to this side of the unit circle for our, for our values that we're, that we're looking for. So let me stop and just say, does that, does that make sense to you? Okay. For cosine, we have the restriction from 0 to pi. So for cosine, we can start at 0, we end at pi, this is where we're looking at for cosine. I'll, I'll color code this for us. And in this second one, when it said, well, if it's not in the defined range, you want to find an equivalent that is, um, say I find uh, that, that I'm, I'm looking for the sine, which is my orange one, the sine of, of 3 pi over 4. The sine of 3 pi over 4 is square root 2 over 2. But it's outside of my domain for sine, so I would actually default to pi over 4 because it's got the same exact sign. Does that make sense now? Because pi over 4 lies within my, my domain of negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, and it's the exact same sign as 3 pi over 4. So that's what, that's what this, second, this second step is talking about. You want to find an equivalent that it does exist within. And then finally, tangent, we also um, restrict to negative pi over 2, positive pi over 2, but those are non-inclusive. So what the way I'll decipher that on my unit circle, I'm not going to draw a little tick mark starting. I'm just going to say, well, you can go up to that tick mark, but you can't get to it. So this is also going to be the part of the unit circle that lies in quadrants one and four, but not exactly negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Okay, so now that we've reminded ourselves of those restrictions and seen what they look like on the unit circle there, let's go ahead and move through evaluating these um, inverse functions here. So we, are start, we start by um, being asked, uh, the inverse sine of one half. Okay, so what I need to do, and I'm going to grab my orange pen because I'm dealing with I'm dealing with sine and, and inverse sine here. The sine 
is one half at pi over six. So since the sine is, I'm sorry, the sine at pi over six is one half, that means that the arc sine of one half has to be pi over six. So that answer there is pi over 6, and it lies within our domain, so we're good. So this is pi over 6. Now, before I move on, are there any questions about how I just did that? Okay, looks like we're good on that then. All right, so I'm going to stick with orange here since I'm still working with sine and arc sine. I'm looking for something that has a sine of negative square root 2 over 2. Well, I've got negative square root 2 over 2 right there at 7 pi over 4. However, 7 pi over 4 lies outside of my domain. Now, now it's, it's, it's still on the, it's in my domain if I'm looking at my unit circle, but I can't write that as 7 pi over 4 because that is greater than pi over 2. That's actually 1 and 3 fourths pi. So what I do is I convert that to its negative equivalent. So if I start at zero and move backwards through the circle or clockwise, that gives me a value of negative one-fourth pi. So this is seven pi over four, but that lies outside my domain, so that is the same thing as negative pi over 4. I've moved backwards through the circle, pi over 4. Is that okay? I need a green check or a red X if that made sense. I don't want to move forward if you're confused on this. Okay, Ken says he's good. Allie says no. Allie, do you have a question? Oh, Allie says yes. <laughs> you just clicked the wrong one. Uh, that's okay. All right. Now let's move on to one with cosine. So the arc cosine of negative square root 3 over 2. Now I'm looking for x values. Remember, cosine is my x, sine is my y. So the arc cosine negative square root 3 over 2, I have an x value of negative square root 3 over 2 at 5 pi over 6. Now, 5 pi over 6 is still within the domain restriction of 0 to pi. I'd have to have 6 pi over 6 to have one full pi. So that's a little less than a full pi, so I'm good with my domain restriction. So this is 5 pi over 6. And finally, the tangent, let me remind you, the tangent is equal to the sine over the cosine. So I'm looking for a ratio of the y value over the x value that equals 1 that is within the domain of the tangent function. So right here at pi over 4, if I divide positive square root 2 over 2 by positive square root 2 over 2, I'm going to get positive 1. So the arc tangent of 1 is pi over 4. 
Okay, we have a couple more to look, or a few more to look at on the right-hand side there. The arc sine of negative 1. So I'm looking for a y value of negative 1. And that happens at 3 pi over 2, but that lies outside my domain restriction. So I need to write it as its negative angle value, and that equivalent is negative pi over 2. I moved backwards 1 half pi through the circle. Okay, tangent inverse of negative 1. Once again, I'm looking for that ratio y divided by x that gives me negative 1 within the domain of tangent. So I'm looking for my, the absolute value of my x and my y to be the same, but one to have a positive uh, sign and one to be a negative. And I find that that lives at 7 pi over 4. That is outside of my restricted domain, so I write this as negative pi over 4. Cosine of negative 1, this is where the x value is negative 1, and we can see that happens right at pi, and that lives in my domain. And then finally, arc cosine of 1 half. So my cosine is 1 half at pi over 3. Okay, are y'all good to move forward from here? Okay, all right. Using your calculator. So you have buttons on your calculator that will do the um, inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent. Your button, uh, if you have a TI-83 or 84, you're going to see, well, this, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be in an exponent there. That should look like sine inverse. Um, this is the notation you're going to see, and it is the second function on your sine cosine tangent button. So that's how you use your calculator. And um, just about from here on out, and when I say on out, I'm talking all the way through calculus, you're going to be using radians instead of degrees. So you'll definitely want to make sure that your calculator is in radian mode here. So if I want to evaluate the arc sign, of 0.97 in my calculator, I just do second and sign that gives me the arc sign, 0.97, close my parenthesis, hit enter, and I get that the arc sign of 0.97 is approximately 1.325. Two. I'll take it out to the fourth decimal, decimal place. Okay, um, Allie and Ken, y'all try that on your calculator and let me know if you get the same thing. Just give me a green check if that's what you get on your calculator when you do it. Okay, great. Everybody got it. All right, give the arc cosine of negative 0 0.4 a try. And type into the chat window what you end up getting and, and go out to the fourth decimal point. Yep, that's what I got. Excellent, y'all both got it. I get approximately 1.9823. Easy enough. So don't forget what you're asking yourself here. Basically, um, a, the cosine of an angle 1.9823 radians 
is equal to negative 0.4. All right. Okay, so using uh, right triangles to work with inverse trig functions. Um, and um, they give you they give you uh, these little formulas up here that you can remember. All these are are the are the um, they're the inverses of sine and cosine that we would normally find by using SOHCAHTOA. So let me just label this triangle up top a little bigger so you can see it. They're calling this side P. They're calling this side A. They're calling this angle theta. And the hypotenuse they are calling H. This is your right angle right here. So if I have the sine of theta, sine is opposite, which is P over the hypotenuse, H. So if you look here, the arc sine of P over H will give me theta. And if I have the cosine of theta, well, the cosine is the adjacent, A, over the hypotenuse, H, and we can see that we've also been given the arc cosine of A over H is equal to theta. So this will help you, say, say you're given a triangle and you're asked to solve the triangle. Well, we know solving the triangle is giving the, the value of the length of all sides of the triangle and giving the measurement of all of the angles of the triangle as well. So this is how we're going to use this stuff with solving triangles. So the first thing I want to do is find the missing side, because I know I can just use the Pythagorean theorem to find the missing side. So um, the Pythagorean theorem, um, I'll use x's and y's, we'll call We'll call this side X that runs horizontally and this side Y, um, and this will just be the hypotenuse. So our Pythagorean theorem says X squared plus Y squared equal to H squared. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Uh, we've also seen the Pythagorean theorem written as sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1 if we're talking about the unit circle, um, which we'll come back to that version of the Pythagorean theorem in a moment. Um, but we'll just use x's and y's and h's here. So I have 9 squared plus y squared equals 12 squared. 81 plus y squared equal to 144 is y squared is equal to 144 minus 81, which gives me 63. And um, y is equal to the square root of 63, if I take the square root of both sides. 63 is the same thing as the square root of 9 times the square root of 7, so we call that 3 square root 7. So here's what I found out. Side y is of length 3 square root 7. Now I'm ready to work on the angles on the inside. Well, I'm given, I don't really want to work with 3 square root 7. That, that just does not feel like a nice, neat number to me. What I do have that's nice and neat is the adjacent side to my angle theta and the hypotenuse for my triangle. Well, if I look up here, cosine relates the adjacent side and the hypotenuse. 
So if I have that my cosine of theta is equal to the ratio of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse, I've got the cosine of theta is equal to 9 twelfths. Well, if I want to know what theta is, I simply take the arc cosine of 9 twelfths, and that gives me theta. So what is theta equal to? Well, this is when I go to my calculator, and I do second and cosine, it gives me the arc cosine, and then 9 divided by 12, and I get that theta is approximately 0.7227. I would probably never give the angles of a right triangle in radians. So I need to convert that to degrees, because that's how we give angles of triangles in, is degrees. So to convert that, we got to remember way back when we learned how to do this. I multiply my radians by 180 over pi. And when I put that into my calculator, I get that that is approximately 41.5. 41 degrees. So I've now found out that theta is 41.41 degrees, and then I just subtract that from 90 degrees, because I know this is 90. I know the interior angles of a triangle add up to 180, so the other two angles have to be equal to 90 together. And so I just subtract the 41.41 from 90, and I get the other angle is 40. Eight. That's an eight. Sorry, forty-eight point five nine degrees, which is just ninety minus forty-one point forty-one. All right. So my triangle is solved. Let's look at this next one. We'll start again with the missing side. So uh, x squared plus six squared has got to equal 10 squared. X squared plus 36 equals 100. X squared equal to 100 minus 36 is 64. X is equal to, when I take the square root of both sides, I technically should put positive or negative 8. And I technically should have put above positive or negative 3 square root 7. However, we're talking about a length here. So there is no such thing as negative length. So I really don't even have to worry about the negative value. My x side is equal to 8. Okay, so the ones that I was given, here's my angle theta. I was given the opposite, and I was given the hypotenuse. Sine relates the opposite and the hypotenuse to each other. So that's what I'm going to use here. I know that the sine of theta has to be equal to 6 over 10, which means the arc sine of 6 over 10 has to be equal to theta. And when I put arc sine, oops, I hit y equals. Um, the arc sine, no, arc sine, I was hitting cosine. All right, arc sine of 6 over 10, I get approximately, so theta is approximately, 0.6435 is what I'm getting. And I want to convert that to degrees, 0.6435 times 180 over pi. And I get that that is approximately 36.87 degrees. So that means theta here is 36.87 degrees. And when I subtract that from 90, I get that this other angle is 53.13 degrees.
All right, any questions of solving right triangles where all you're given is two sides and you have to use the inverse function to find the missing angles? Any questions about that? Okay, green check if you're ready to move forward from here. Ken says yes, yeah. Allie says yes, yeah. awesome. Okay, finding exact values of composite functions with inverse trigonometric functions. So, um, if you think way back to um, inverse functions in college algebra, you will recall that if you compose a function with its inverse and then compose the inverse with its function, each time you get out x, in this case they're saying y. But um, so that's what this is showing you here, is that if you compose a function with its inverse, you just get your input value out because all of the function part has been undone by its inverse function. And the same thing for composing the inverse function with its function, this would just be x here. Okay, so that's what all of this is saying to you down here. And you've got to be careful about the restrictions on the domain. So, um, sine composed with arc sine of x is x. I'm not going to go through all these. They're, they, you always end up with X, but the main thing is, is that you keep your eyes on the restrictions. Notice that um, when you are composing the trig function with its inverse trig function, that you can have an expanded domain. But those regular restrictions come back when it's the inverse trig function on the outside. Okay. Let's look and see what all this business is about. Here's our good old unit circle again. Okay. So, evaluate the following. So, all that, all that at the top is telling you is the same thing we just talked about. If you if you um, compose the inverse with its function, you get out um, theta itself. And if theta is in the restricted domain of f, then that is true. If it's not in there, then you've got to find another angle that is equivalent to it that does live in the restricted domain. Okay. So, the inverse sine of the sine, composed with the sine of pi over 3. Well, pi over 3 lives in our restricted domain of negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So, the uh, arc sine composed with the sine of pi over 3 is simply pi over 3. Okay. The arc sine composed with the sine of 2 pi over 3. Well, it would be 2 pi over 3, except that 2 pi over 3 does not live in our restricted domain of negative pi to pi. 2 pi over 3 is over here. Okay? So what we have to do is say, okay, well, the sine of 2 pi over 3, remember that is, that's talking about the y value of that point, the sine of 2 pi over 3 is the exact same thing as the sine of pi over 3, except pi over 3 lives in my domain. 
So this is the same thing as the sine of pi over 3. So the arc sine composed with the sine of 2 pi over 3 is equal to pi over 3. Okay, green check if that one made sense to you. Yes. Ken, how about you? Yes. I'm glad I haven't confused the heck out of y'all tonight. Okay, remember cosine, let me get a different color here. Cosine goes from 0 to pi in its restricted domain. So the arc cosine composed with the cosine of 2 pi over 3, well, the cosine of 2 pi over 3 is negative 1 half. It, it lives in my domain, so I don't need to do any switcheroo, so that's just 2 pi over 3. I was confused for a second, but it came together. Okay, good, good. And this next one lives outside, so we'll have another example of um, having to do the switcheroo. So if we look, the cosine of negative pi over 3, that the negative pi over 3, that's moving backwards through the circle, one-third pi. That puts me here at 5 pi over 3. The cosine at that point is positive one-half. So the equivalent angle that has the same cosine that lives inside my restricted domain is pi over 3. So the cosine inverse composed with the cosine of negative pi over 3 is pi over 3. Because we want it to live in our restricted domain. Okay, green check if you're ready to move forward. Okay, good deal. All right, evaluating compositions of the form f inverse of g of x. So for special values of x, we can exactly evaluate the inner function and then the outer function, which is the inverse. However, we can find a more general approach by considering the relation between the two acute angles of the right triangle, where one is theta and the other is, I'm sorry, that is not theta. That is, der, I just lost the Greek word for that little symbol there. We'll call it the other angle. <laughs> So we know that a 90 degree angle is equal to pi over 2 radians. So if we're given angle theta in radians, it should make sense that the other angle, other angle, <laughs> that's what we're calling it, is that 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians minus the first angle theta. Okay, so that's the relation that they're setting up, that, um, that if you have your angle theta, which is one angle that is not the right angle of the right triangle, then the other one has to be pi over 2 minus theta. So um, if we look here, we have the cosine of theta being b over c. So here's, here's, let me get a different color. Here's theta. Cosine is the ka part of Sokotoa. So it's the adjacent over the hypotenuse. That's where they got the b over c ratio there. But that's also going to be the equivalent of the sine, let me get a different color, the sine of 
pi over 2 minus theta. So now if I'm talking about this angle here, sine is so, that's the opposite over the hypotenuse. So those two things are equivalent there. Was that clear for you? Okay, Allie says yes. Okay, good deal. And um, so um, that that's one way that we work with this. And and I'll just point out the other the other um, relationships that we get. So if we take the arc sine of the cosine of theta, we end up getting pi over 2 minus theta, that other angle. And um, we also have the sine of theta equaling A over C, which is the same thing as the cosine of pi over 2 minus theta. And if we take the arc cosine of the sine of theta, we get pi over 2 minus theta. Okay, and then down here, this is just kind of codified everything for us. We'll use all this stuff on the next page. Okay, so we are asked to evaluate sine inverse of the cosine of 13 pi over 6. Well, I know right off the bat that 13 pi over 6 lies outside of my restricted domain. 13 pi over 6. Let's see. 13 pi over 6 is the same exact thing as 12 pi over 6 plus pi over 6, which is 2 pi plus pi over 6. Well, if I start out at pi over 6 and I go around the circle 2 pi, I land right back at pi over 6. So I could just as easily change this to taking the sine inverse of the cosine of pi over 6. And now I live inside the domain that I've been restricted to. Let me stop there and make sure that that part made sense to you. Okay. Good deal. All right. So they asked us to do this two different ways. Direct evaluation is what I've started doing here. So let me just label this. I'm literally starting with the inside function. And I'm going to evaluate pi, the cosine of pi over 6. So this is direct here. Okay, so the cosine, so I've still got the sine inverse of. The cosine of pi over 6 is equal to, okay, so pi over 6 cosine is my x value. That is equal to square root 3 over 2. And the arc sine of square root 3 over 2, okay, so that's asking, okay, when my y value is square root 3 over 2, and it's my y value because now I'm talking about sine, when my y value is square root 3 over 2, what angle am I at? I am at pi over 3. 
So that's direct evaluation. We can use the method that we learned on the last page that says, so I'm just going to put, well, let me get a different color. I'm going to put the other method, that relationship that we saw set up on the last page, right here. The inverse sine of the cosine of x equals pi over 2 minus y. Okay. So, Over here, this was my original x value. And what I ended up with was a y value of pi over 6. So, to set up that relationship, I have that the sine inverse of the cosine of 13 pi over 6 is equal to pi over 2 minus that leftover, pi over 6. So I have to find a common denominator to put those together. So I'm going to multiply pi over 2 by 3 over 3 to get a 6 in the denominator. That is 3 pi over 6 minus pi over 6. That leaves me with 2 pi over 6. I have a common factor of 2. 2 goes into 2 once and into 6 three times. And that leaves me with the same thing I found above, pi over 3. Okay, let's take a look at the arc cosine of the sine of negative 11 pi over 4. And we'll do it both methods. We'll start with the direct method, literally working with the sine of negative 11 pi over 4 and then taking the arc cosine of that. So direct. I start out with the cosine, oh, Negative 11 pi over 4 lies outside of my restricted domain. Okay, negative 11 pi over 4. Let me grab my pen here. Let's see, I'll put a barrier here so I can work up in this space here. Um, negative 11 pi over 4. Four. Let's see, 4 goes into 11 twice. So that's the same exact thing as negative 8 pi over 4 um, minus 3 pi over 4, which is the same thing as negative 2 pi minus 3 pi over 4. Negative 3 pi over 4, I'm taking the sign of that. Okay, so negative 3 pi over 4. Here is, let me get a lighter color. Okay, so here's negative 1, four, one pi over 4, negative 2 pi over 4, negative 3 pi over 4. Negative 3 pi over 4 is still outside my domain there. So um, that is the equivalent of 5 pi over 4. So that, that's, where, that's where I'm going to start with finding that inside sign because I don't want to deal with negative 11 pi over 4. So I'm going to start with my inside. Let me change away from the yellow. So I have the arc sine 
the sine of negative 11 pi over 4 is the same thing as the sine of 5 pi over 4. That lives inside negative 1 to 1. Um, so I'm okay taking that sign. The sign is my y value. That gives me negative square root. Oh, let me not write it this way. I still have the um, arc cosine that I need to write because I'm just working on the inside here. Arc cosine of, well, the sine of 5 pi over 4 is negative square root 2 over 2. So remember, now this is asking, what, what angle value has a cosine of negative square root 2 over 2? And remember, cosine is my x value. So inside my restricted domain, remember it's, it, it goes from 0 to pi for, for cosine and, and arc cosine. This is saying what, cos, what angle has a cosine value of negative square root 2 over 2? That is 3 pi over 4. So this is equal to 3 pi over 4. That's the direct method, literally finding the inside and then evaluating the outside function. Our other method, other, we have the relationship. Let me go back one. We have this relationship here. I'll just take a screenshot and bring it over. Marvels of modern technology here. There we go. There's the relationship. Okay. So um, remember my original x value is negative 11 pi over 4. My original x is negative 11 pi over 4, and my y value ended up being 3 pi over 4. I'm sorry, negative 3 pi over 4. Where did I do that? Right here. Negative 3 pi over 4. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and set that relationship up. I have that the cosine inverse of the sine of negative 11 pi over 4 is equal to pi over 2 minus negative 3 pi over 4. Remember, minus a negative is a plus. And I need to find a common denominator, so I'm going to multiply by 2 over 2 there to create 4 in my denominator. So 2 pi over 4 plus 3 pi over 4 gives me 5 pi over 4. That lies outside my domain there, 5 pi over 4 with cosine, and we found that the equivalent to that was 3 pi over 4. So this is equal to 3 pi over 4 with it living in the restricted domain. Okay, green check if you're ready to move forward. And we did go over an hour. I'm sorry. We have a little bit left to go. I didn't think it was going to take us this long to get through. We have... Four more problems to work through with this stuff. Okay.
know, fix more problems for. Goodness. Okay, so this last part, and this last part all has to do with the same thing. I'm going to do a couple of them using a longer method, and um, then I will use the, the quickie cheat method that, that we're given in the paragraph above. All of this next stuff is based on the Pythagorean identity, sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x equals 1. And I will also write that in another form for you. And we did this in an earlier lesson, sine squared um, x plus cosine squared x equals 1. And if I come and I divide everything by the cosine squared of x, I end up getting that first term sine squared of x over cosine squared of x. That's tangent squared x plus cosine squared of x divided by cosine squared of x is 1 equals 1 over the cosine squared of x, which is the secant, of, secant squared of x. But I'm just going to leave it, leave it like that for right now. Okay, so let's look at this first one. Um, and what we're told is it, when we when we solve for this Pythagorean identity, we end up getting that the sine of the cosine inverse of x is equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared. So just real quick, x squared plus y squared equals 1. If I subtract x squared from both sides, I get y squared equals 1 minus x squared. Divide, I'm sorry, I take the square root of both sides, I get y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. That's where that came from. Okay. All right, so find an exact value for the sine of the cosine inverse of 4 fifths? Well, either I can painstakingly move through using the Pythagorean identity, valid, or I, I see that this relationship is already set up for me, and I can say, okay, well, if I have the sine of the cosine inverse of 4 fifths, that has to equal the square root of 1 minus, well, my x is my 4 fifths, 4 fifths squared. Okay? So that's the square root of 1 minus 16 25ths. I need to get a common denominator, so I'm going to multiply 1 by 25 over 25. And that is the square root of 25 over 25 minus 16 over 25, which is the square root of 9 over 25, which is the same thing as 3 fifths. So the sine of theta, if I'm calling the cosine inverse of 4 fifths theta, the sine of theta is 3 fifths. And that's my answer. The cosine of theta is 4 fifths. I get that from here. This tells me that the cosine of theta is 4 fifths. Yeah. All right, moving on to this next one. We'll use the um, Pythagorean theorem for this one so you can see how that would work. So we already have this relationship that we went through up here. So I'm just going to write this as tangent squared theta plus 1 equals 1 over cosine squared theta. 
And um, I know that the tangent of theta is equal to 5 twelfths. I get that from, from uh, my arc tangent of 5 twelfths. So I can replace tangent squared theta with 5 twelfths squared plus 1 has to equal 1 over cosine squared theta. All right. And 5 twelfths squared is 25. 144 plus 1 has to equal 1 over the cosine squared of theta. I need to get a common denominator so that I can add those fractions on the left-hand side. So 144 over 144 will give me that common denominator. 25 plus 144 is 169. 144 and that equals 1 over cosine squared theta. I cross multiplied here. Cross multiplication only happens across an equal sign. Really all you're doing is multiplying by the denominator on both sides all in one step. So I get 169 cosine squared theta is equal to 144. Divide both sides by 169. And cosine squared theta equal to 144 over 169. Take the square root of both sides. And I get the cosine of theta is equal to 12 thirteenths. Okay, green checker, red X. Okay, okay. I appreciate y'all hanging in here so late on this. I think it's important to see all of these, though, because they all have little differences with them. Okay, so in this particular problem, we have that the tangent of theta is equal to 7 fourths. We also know that the tangent of theta is equal to the adjacent no, I'm sorry, the opposite over adjacent. So this is another way to look at this. The opposite over the adjacent. If I have a right triangle, and we'll consider this my theta, The opposite <clears throat> is 7. The adjacent is 4. I can very easily find my hypotenuse here. 4 squared plus 7 squared is equal to my hypotenuse squared. 16 plus 49 equal to hypotenuse squared. 65 equal to hypotenuse squared, square root of 65 is my hypotenuse, square root of 65. Okay, so now because of this triangle, I'm trying to figure out what the sign of that thing is. I know because of my triangle that the sine of theta has to be equal to 7 over the square root of 65. So the sine of the arc tangent of 7 fourths is equal to the sine of theta, which is equal to 7 over the square root of 65. I can't leave it like that. I need to rationalize the denominator, so I multiply by square root 65 over square root 65, and I get 
that the sine of theta is equal to 7 square root 65 over 55. That's it. Okay, the next one. I know that because of the inside of the function here, that the sine of theta has to be equal to 7 ninths. Well, I can either draw a triangle, I can use the Pythagorean theorem, or I can use the um, square root of 1 minus x squared relationship that I know I have. Um, I'll use... I'll use the Pythagorean theorem on this one. So we have sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta has to equal 1. Since I know what my sine is, I can use this. So this is 7 ninths squared plus cosine squared theta has to equal 1. It's 49 81st plus cosine squared theta equaling 1. I'm going to subtract 49 81st from both sides. 1 minus 49 81st. I need to get a common denominator there. And I get... Cosine squared theta equal to 81 80 over 81 minus 49 over 81. So cosine squared theta equal to um, 32 81st. Now I need to take the square root of both sides. So I get the cosine of theta equal to the square root of 32 over 9. And the square root of 32 simplifies into the square root of 16 times the square root of 2 over 9. I can take the square root of 16 and get 4. So the cosine of theta is equal to 4 square root 2 over 9. Green check or red X. And I'm actually going to hold off doing these last, well... That one's got, they both have variables in them. You do them the same way, you just leave the variables in there. I, we've already gone on this 20 minutes past, and I don't want to keep y'all any longer. Um, so hopefully this was enough for you. Y'all good to go on all this? Oh, awesome. Thank y'all so much for hanging in here so late. Y'all have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.